Oglądają Państwo Monitor Polwyżyn. Serdecznie witamy po przerwie. W naszym studiu specjalny gość Matt Tyrmand, ekonomista, działacz społeczny, syn Leopolda Tyrmanda. Matt, so great to have you over here in Polvision. And I know you've uh, graduated from University of Chicago, so Chicago has been close to your heart uh, ever since. And you're coming to the city, although you live in New York. How the city is changing? Ah, oh, the city is changing dramatically. Uh, some ways for the better, some ways for the worse. I mean, I've been coming to Chicago uh, since 1999 when I started school in Hyde Park and then I lived here for a bit and now I do uh, I work with some organizations out here so I'm here all the time uh, the city I mean where I lived close to here we're uh, in Avondale I lived in Logan Square for a bit in 2000 2001 and I mean at that point it was not gentrified and my car was broken into quite regularly now <laughs> it looks like it's a lot nicer nice restaurants and uh, just a really good, wholesome neighborhood. So you visited one restaurant yesterday, uh, the release party for the book uh, uh, Greater uh, Chicago and Chicago's Polonia uh, by our mutual friends. What do you think about the book? How important it is to capture the spirit of Polish-American diaspora here in the Windy City of Chicago? Oh, I think it's great. Uh, this neighborhood is, is so integral to Chicago Polish history and, and Chicago Polish history is so integral to the American Polish experience uh, that to really document for posterity the history of this neighborhood, which they did an incredible job with. These, uh, this series of books, Images of America, that goes through different neighborhoods and looks at them historically uh, is phenomenal. It's actually a series that I was familiar with because one of the things I was studying in Chicago was urban geography, and we focused a lot on Chicago. So I was using these books, and now to see Avondale and this sort of Milwaukee Avenue Polish corridor get more historical attention is, is really great. I have a connection to the neighborhood uh, as well. I spent a lot of time when I was living living in Hyde Park at Chris's Billiards on uh, Milwaukee Avenue in Jefferson Park. And so it's, uh, I've been coming to this neighborhood for decades. It was the first time uh, that when I, uh, when I came to the Midwest in Chicago that I came to a Polish neighborhood was along this Milwaukee Avenue corridor to come get food and to sort of re-engage uh, the, the family culture. Too bad we don't have that much power anymore. We used to have uh, uh, congressmen, representatives. You are involved in politics. You work with Adam Andrzejewski, former uh, candidate for governor of Illinois. And you doing what? Uh, well, Adam and I have an organization called Open the Books. And our goal is to put every dollar, dime, penny taxed and spent online from every layer of government. So we have over 1.3 billion lines of spending in this uh, metadata common, accessible online at openthebooks.com. Uh, and with this money trail, we call out the corruption and the cronyism and hopefully get indictments, get some of these criminals fired. Uh, these are, you know, the worst seem to enter politics, both in Poland and in the U.S. It's, uh, there used to be an old expression, those who can do, those who can't teach. But I think now for the 21st century, those who can do, those who can't, go into politics and tell us all what to do and then extort from us. So we are very, very hungry to, uh, to be at the front lines of this battle, especially in Illinois, which has the worst of the worst of state political systems and city of Chicago. It's an absolute obscenity time and again. Uh, so we are really on the front lines fighting this battle. And I'm trying to fight the same battle in Poland and bring the platform to Poland uh, to the consternation of cronies like Hanna Gronkiewicz Walsh, who when I publicly said I was going to bring this platform here so that city of uh, Varsovian uh, citizens could, uh, could examine how the city's spending their money, uh, all of the uh, city bureaucrats and apparatchiks turned bright red and w refused to talk to me after. So they do not like sunlight. <laughs> exactly. What are then those similarities in, in government styles between the United States and, and, and Poland, those ones that you would like to see changing? Yep. Well, they both exist, and all politicians exist uh, in a sense, to further entrench, deepen their power and their capacity to stay there ever longer and longer and make themselves uh, more comfortable, whether it's from a, a power cementing process or from money. Usually it's money. Uh, without term limits, and this is something that I talk about in Poland all the time, we don't have term limits in the US, and that's why our system is such a disaster in my view. Poland is a nascent democracy. There's still a lot of growing pains and a lot of things that can be worked out and the fact that there are no term limits is something that I'm very vocal about. Balcerowicz, who's become a good friend and someone I've worked with on uh, some issues like the pension nationalization, Ulfa, uh, 
term limits is also an important issue for him, so we're hoping to sort of galvanize the, the NGO community into taking up this issue in Poland because when Poles ask me when I talk about the free market miracle in Poland of the last 25 years and the Bolcherowicz plan and the success and you see it in the visual skyline in Warsaw, you see it everywhere in Poland, the improvements, but Poles ask me all the time, you know, all this GDP, where have the wages gone? Why have wages been stagnant over now almost two generations? And the reason is because politicians stole it. It should have been trickling down to the workforce, but instead the government class doubled, tripled in size and in its expense ratio. So it, uh, guys uh, in the SEM now have staffs of 20 instead of staffs of three. That's where all the wage growth went. And that's why Poland needs term limits. It really does to, to hinder this because it's only getting worse. More and more money going to the cronies, less and less going to improve Poland, and it's really criminal. In Illinois, few past governors end up in jail. Uh, yeah, uh, I think three out of the last four. <laughs> and uh, I would make the argument that the current governor, Governor Quinn, uh, should belong alongside uh, some of these guys like George Ryan and Blagojevich. I mean, he has been involved in some of the shadiest scandals that I've ever seen. And you've got an attorney general that can't seem to find a corrupt politician in a state where every politician is brazenly corrupt. Uh, so, I mean, Illinois is an absolute debacle, unfortunately. Let's talk about your dad. I mean, a sure. uh, uh, figure for Polish-American literature. Uh, everybody knows uh, Leopold Turmant in Poland. Now more than ever, yeah, which <laughs> is really, really great. Yeah. And you work to promote the legacy of your dad. Uh, one of it displayed in, in that great book of yours. Very aggressively, yeah. Well, I, uh, I wrote a book called Jestem uh, Tierman, uh, Sin Leopolda, and it's uh, sort of an autobiograph autobiographical account of engaging my Polish roots, engaging his legacy, because he died when I was four. And we were born, my sister and I, actually in Rockford, Illinois, uh, not too far from here, you know, an hour, hour and a half from here, uh, because he founded a conservative think tank called the Rockford Institute there. But when he died, my mother felt it would be better if she uh, moved us to Brooklyn, New York City, where her family was, so we could have that support. And I'm somewhat thankful that I grew up in New York as opposed to Rockford, Illinois. Uh, but I do have these, uh, these Midwestern roots. Uh, so I wrote this book after going to Poland uh, for several years. I'd been going rather incognito, and I went to a town called Darwowo, where he set one of his novels, uh, the Seven Long Voyages, Siedem Deliko Reshov, my accent is horrible. <laughs> uh, and there was a journalist there. I was there uh, invited by the city to, uh, to do cut a ribbon. They were naming a square after him because one of the reasons the town was quote unquote famous was because he set this novel there. And so a journalist there wanted to do an article, just what is the son of Tiermond up to in America? And we started talking and talking and talking and said, so, so as you can see, I like talking. It's <laughs> my only skill, so I like to try and use it. Uh, and she said, would you be interested if we did something a little bit large, larger format? And I said, sure. And we worked on this. Her name is Kamila Sipniewska. She's got a background with, uh, with a lot of the top uh, Polish press institutions and great journalist and together we kind of wrote this because I don't speak or write in Polish unfortunately so I needed her obviously for that fundamental reason but more than that uh, the way she helped me get the thoughts out in a way that I could communicate more uh, more diplomatically as opposed to less uh, with a rant which is usually the way I communicate these days out of <laughs> frustration uh, so she softened the edges of my communication really really well and so I went on a book tour in Poland last year and really did some great interviewing and uh, of course, uh, the publisher wanted me to stay away from politics in all these interviews, but it seemed to go straight to politics. <laughs> but I was able to garner a, a Super Express column out of the thing, so now I write for Super Express, and they don't mind what I write. So, because Ada Borcher won't print me or even pay any attention because oh. they don't like me. So, Super Express uh, is a great venue for me. They let me say whatever I want. <laughs> what is the most important lesson you've learned from your dad? Stubbornness, uh, that's the, his most overarching trait. Stubbornness not for the sake of being stubborn, but stubbornness in holding on to your ideals when everything around you is working to coerce you and undermine you and bring you off of that. I mean, his life was right out of uh, 1984 in a lot of levels. I mean, it was, he was really facing the coercive nature of the apparatus. And because he refused to bend and was so vocal and so adamant that he was right, the whole weight of the apparatus was thrust onto him. And they really tried to destroy him without imprisoning him. They, I think their view was that would have been the easy way out. They made sure he could not work. He couldn't even get a job as a waiter. They literally were trying to starve him and grind him down. And his stubbornness saved him. And I definitely 
I have that that has been passed through the DNA is this sort of stubborn uh, belief in your convictions and your ideals and I certainly don't have to face the same uh, the same apparatus that he does but certainly in Poland in the 21st century and in the US in Chicago and in New York and these bastions of elitism I've also had to deal with uh, organizations that would try and silence my views or ignore me if that would be the best way to to try and undermine me and I am constantly fighting to try and get some very unpopular viewpoints like smaller government out there and that has not endeared me to the establishment in either country like for example on Wall Street yeah. like you see what's happening on the Wall Street and that general question that we would like to end up this interview with where are we all headed Oh, it's not pretty. There's an old economic theorem that says if something can't go on forever, it won't. And the loose monetary policy engaged both in Europe and in the U.S., it's not a uh, solution. I liken it metaphorically to putting bandages on gunshot wounds. Eventually the patient bleeds out. And we will. I mean, all the major money center banks are insolvent still. They're just as leveraged. They can't recognize what they're holding on their balance sheets because it would be an immediate wiping away of all commercial and consumer deposits behind it. Uh, and the government recognizes this, so that's why they continually print money and buy the debt issued by the sovereigns in Europe. Uh, it will end very, very badly. Uh, timing it is, is very, very difficult, uh, but I, uh, my own economic advice, and I, get, I lecture a lot in Poland about this sort of subject, is you have to stay in uh, you have to stay liquid and honestly I believe in gold I do not believe in mark to market assets assets that are bid up in an auction system where the government coercion of printing money can force those numbers up uh, so uh, my biggest advice to people economically is small business and don't be too successful otherwise you become a target for extortion unfortunately <laughs> what's uh, in store for Matt Thurman in the future uh, well, I'm working really hard here in, uh, in the U.S. on the Open the Books project. We are talking about bringing it to Poland. I'm doing a lot of things in Poland. I'm working on some uh, investments and starting some businesses there. I actually want to uh, create Tirmandufka. My father was famous for the undrinkable swill he, uh, <laughs> he created. It's a great story behind it. He was imprisoned by the NKVD in Vilno at the, at the start of the war. He left Paris and went where he was in school in 1939, and he went to Vilno. And then he was imprisoned, and he shared a cell with a guy who worked for the biggest state-owned vodka distillery. And so he was taught uh, in a cell on paper how to make vodka. And the, uh, we don't know if the formulation ever really was done the right way because this was somewhat uh, horrible, according to my mother. And uh, none of the guests who were forced to drink it ever really looked like they enjoyed it. But uh, as a sort of homage to him and, and uh, the rebelliousness of the Tirman brand, I think Tirman Dufka is a, uh, a great idea. Uh, I'm working on buying an already existing brewery in Poland because I think that's a great business. I want to invest in Poland. I want to create jobs in Poland. Uh, I'm certainly promoting my father's work everywhere I can and, and my own and uh, my own sort of political ideas, which I believe are the evolution of his. Uh, it's definitely a legacy that I feel uh, justified in carrying on. Uh, and uh, we're doing some movies. Uh, as we should be coming to uh, theaters in the next year and a half. We're going to start filming in the next few months when pre-production. So it's going to be a really, really cool project. So. so good luck with Termandufka, good luck with movies, yeah, uh, book, uh, yeah. open the books and yeah, got a lot. Good luck. Got a lot of good stuff. Life. Thank you. Matt Termand, panie i panowie, e, jedyny i niepowtarzalny syn Leopolda Termanda, ekonomista i działacz społeczny w monitorze Polwyżyn. Wracamy po krótkiej przerwie. Przed nami e, między innymi wiadomości sportowe, prognoza pogody oraz kurs amerykańskiego dolara w Polsce, więc zostańcie z nami.